Israel's Prime Minister just dropped a bombshell announcement at the United Nations General Assembly today, and he said that he fully supports the two-state solution, which essentially means creating a Palestinian state inside of Israel. He might have just ruined his political career, but Israeli voters will decide that at the ballot box this November. Hello and welcome to The Israel Guys, where we believe that in a world of anti-Israel propaganda and Jew hatred, you should have a direct connection to the land and people of Israel. Guys, make sure you subscribe, follow us wherever you're listening, watching, hit that notification bell, get that conversation going down below. We just hit 50,000 subscribers, couldn't be more excited. Next goal, 100,000. This message needs to be heard loud and clear. Share The Israel Guys and help us out by hitting that subscribe button. Um, we would love to have you join the team and follow us on all the social media platforms at The Israel Guys. So just literally minutes ago, watched the speech live of uh, Prime Minister Lapid, and um, a lot of people predicted this, but we wanted to be sure, so we waited to actually record this show late at night um, here to make sure that that's what was happening because you guys know um, Bibi Netanyahu has waffled on this topic. He was a big proponent of the two-state solution, Palestinian state, um, but in more recent years, he has kind of reneged on that idea. Also, really, the Israeli public has kind of backed off of the idea of a Palestinian state because they just realized... It's not practically possible. Well, Yair Lapid decided to try and take the country back 20 years by going to the UN and saying, I support the two-state solution, which is absolutely crazy and not possible at all. And it's definitely a huge political stunt. Well, Luke, why would you say it's not possible at all? And I think we should talk about that for a little bit because here's the facts on the ground. You have 700,000 Israelis living inside what the world wants to create a Palestinian state. So there was what? Uh, just a few thousand people in Gaza and they pulled those people out. You want to move 700,000 people out of Judea and Samaria, East Jerusalem? You're absolutely out of your mind. It's impossible to create a Palestinian state in what's known as the pre-1967 uh, borders. That's mm -hmm. insanity at its finest. To even state such a thing uh, is really uh, outlandish. This is just impossible. Uh, but there's a lot of semantics involved in this discussion now. And this was what even makes it more outlandish and insane, is that what the Israeli prime minister just voiced uh, to the UN General Assembly is he, what he's saying and what they're hearing is to totally, completely, 100% different things. When he says a two-state solution, and even he, even though he clarifies, we'll talk about it in a minute, that it'll be a demilitarized state, that's not what the world is hearing. The world it's is also hearing. It's not possible. It's I not mean, even possible to do that happen, to start with. Yeah. It. yeah. They're never, ever, 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 not in a million years, you could keep this cycle of peace talks going on and it will just never happen to get an agreement between Israel and the Palestinian Authority on borders, much less uh, a code of how they're supposed to act. No, they're not going to agree on borders and they're not going to agree on how to act and the Muslims will never put down their weapons. So it's an end game now. So to bring it up on the UN as though it's possible is literally just playing a big game. It's literally a game going on right now on the world stage. So, I mean, I watched Yair Lapid's speech and I was actually, to be honest, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 you, you, you know, people know this. I'm the more moderate. So I'll give him the, uh, I thought his speech was pretty good, except for the Palestinian state part. Right. And up until he got to there, and you might, you might even agree with me. Like no, he I'm sounded totally agree good. With you. Like, and also his English was good. His speech making was good, um, which he's the interim prime minister. He hasn't been doing this very long. So he's kind of new to the political spectrum, right? Um, so he talked about how Israel has made peace with its Arab neighbors, how Israel has risen, you know, out of the uh, ashes and built a thriving economy in the region. And then he went into Iran and he laid it on thick. Like he called the UN out for being silent. Um, and he talked about how the only option for stopping Iran would be to have a credible military presence. And that's the only way that they wouldn't get a nuclear weapon. And he was very firm that uh, the Iran wants to destroy Israel, wants to destroy America, burns both of their flags, and that the UN should be doing more. And then he went on to say, 
Israel will not allow Iran to get a nuclear weapon because if they get a nuclear weapon, they will use it against Israel. Yeah. And he said that 100%, and it was a very strong, very good statement. But then he, t he, he segued into how because Israel has a strong military and a strong country, they can use that strength to create peace with someone else, their neighbors, the Palestinian Arabs. And he immediately, which is, this is where it got really confusing because his speech was really good. And maybe we can play a clip. Israel is a proud sovereign nation and an equal member of the United Nations. We will not be silent when those who wish to harm us use this very stage to spread lies about us. The only way to prevent Iran from getting a nu nuclear weapon is to put a credible military threat on the table. The Jews today have a state. We have an army. We have great friendships, first and foremost the United, with the United States. We have capabilities, and we are not afraid to use them. We will do whatever it takes. Iran will not get a nuclear weapon. He then said, that because Israel's so strong, they can make peace with their neighbors, the Palestinians. And he said things like, and these are uh, rough quotes, things like, peace is not a compromise. It's the most courageous decision that we can make. Peace is not weakness. And then he said, war is the surrender to all that is bad within us. Peace is the victory of all that's good. Now that sounds really like peace loving, but it's really weird because immediately before this, he said strength, and a military presence is the only way to stop Iran, basically being strong. And then he said, but war, and he more or less said, strength is not the answer for making peace with the Palestinians. And uh, he even said, it, war is the surrender. Basically, like strength is the surrender, but making peace would be the victory. And so it was very, very confusing because he immediately said, strength for Iran, and then he kind of said, like, but weakness for making peace with the Palestinians. And he made it very clear. He said, a large majority of Israelis support the two-state solution. I am one of them. Now, first of all, that's not true because support for the uh, two-state solution has drastically, drastically dropped in recent years here in Israel. Lapid may be one of the ones that supports the two-state solution. He's the current prime minister, although I have a feeling he's not going to be for very much longer. But the large majority of, of Israelis do not support the two-state solution. He did say it would only create a Palestinian state on one condition and that it has to be peaceful. But like you mentioned before, <laughs> impossible. It's absolutely impossible. So um, what does this speech mean? Obviously, it's kind of a bombshell, but we're like five weeks away from elections here in Israel. Um, basically, Lapid is he's uh, staking his claim. He's saying, I'm not I'm not uh, catering to the conservatives. I'm not catering to the right wingers not even really catering to the centrist or the center to right, you know, right to center. He's basically saying, I'm left, and I want to head the largest liberal party in Israel, and I want to attract um, the left-wing parties and the Arab parties, and I want to be the head of the largest left-wing party. So if you believe in these things, you can vote for me. But if not, then don't vote for me. And that's basically what he's saying, and that's exactly what we're going to see in the elections first week of November. And it'll be interesting to see where Israel stands, but I kind of think he probably just drove a lot of Israeli voters away from voting for him in five weeks. So basically, to boil down the speech, he's very hard on Iran. We're giving him uh, claps for that. We're saying, yes, uh, go Prime Minister Yair Lapid on your position on Iran. It's hardcore. It's great. You're holding the, the flag high, and you're making Israelis proud to be a strong nation and defending itself against a uh, radical Islamic movement in Iran that is attempting to threaten the literal survival of the nation of Israel. Uh, they're not playing around there. But when it comes to the other enemies, like proxies of Iran, this is where we get a little weak. And we're saying, no, this is not really, we don't, we're, not, we're not agreeing with this side of the speech. We're saying, no, we need to be hard on Iran, and we need to be hard on Iran's proxies. Because he even mentioned in his speech, Luke, he talked about Iran's funding of Hamas and the Islamic Jihad um, and, the, and Hezbollah. These, these groups are funded and literally mentioned their proxies, but we're going to be easy on the proxies, hard on the, the founders over here in Iran. No, 
we're pushing, and most of Israelis, we really are, are don't see that stat. I don't know where he got that stat that most Israelis are pro-two-state, because I have not seen that anywhere. I'm not understanding where that's coming from. Uh, it seems to be one of those made-up ones. I, I really have not seen that here in Israel. And if you find that stat, put it in the quotes, uh, you know, down in the comments below. It did used to be, like... 15 years ago, yeah. 20 years ago, like you probably say more than 50%, but not anymore. Absolutely not. Luke, there's a really, uh, f f a real phenomenon going on because the world is still in like total, just minds are totally out of reality in this fog that a two state could happen. Literally, the prime minister of Israel, Yair Lapid, speaks to the general the UN General Assembly just now, a few minutes ago. And tomorrow, guess who speaks? Mahmoud Abbas has a stage there. A podium is set for him at the General Assembly, and he will be giving his remarks. And we assume that he is going to give his normal uh, Israel hate speech, blaming Israel for a stagnant uh, pause in the peace talks and all of this garbage, and that it's all Israel's fault, there's no peace, and not taking responsibility for one big, large terror regime that's under the PA control that is literally has one goal, and that's to wipe Israel off the map. Uh, you're not going to hear about that at the UN. They're, they're rejecting those facts on the ground about that. And, uh, and that's going to be presented tomorrow. So we'll be looking forward to seeing what ha actually Mahmoud Abbas has to say at the General Assembly tomorrow. Now, what we also should say is, is that uh, Ibrahim Raisi, the uh, Iranian president, also has been speaking with the UN Gen General Assembly. And this is a quote. This is, we got a lot of stuff going on over there at the UN right now. There's a quote. The occupier Zionist regime is the most significant state sponsor of terrorism. Its agenda is to slaughter women and children in Gaza and the West Bank. End quote. That is flipped upside down, backwards. You can't get a bigger and broader lie than that. He's basically taking what he does and then flipping that on and saying Israel does that. No, that's absolutely complete uh, fake, made up, ridiculous uh, propaganda uh, that's hitting the world stage right now, literally, and the UN is okay with that. They're okay with giving him a podium and saying these things, and the UN accepts that, and then they'll hear from the other side. And I, I actually appreciate what uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, Yair Lapid, said. This is crazy. This, you cannot allow this in the UN. He was very strong on that. So we appreciate that. Another thing on the world stage that's happening that you guys should be aware of, next week, Saudi Arabia has scheduled a meeting following up. Again, just note, peace talks, Peace in Israel and the Palestinians is like the biggest thing happening in the world. Some like why there's big problems happening in the world, but the world has this like consuming uh, passion and like unreal uh, just infatuation with this thing in Israel with Israel and creating another Palestinian state or another Arab state, a Palestinian state. Um, Saudi Arabia is interested in this as well as the whole Arab world. And Saudi Arabia's foreign ministry and the Euro European Union's foreign ministry, our foreign, foreign policy chief, are gathering together behind closed doors to have a meeting next Wednesday, ne Wednesday next week. There's going to be 25 countries there, 25 countries represented with one goal, and that's to uh, build up again the idea of an Arab state inside the borders of Israel. And guess who's not invited? Israel's not invited to these talks because this needs to be decided without Israel. That's also going on the world stage uh, right now. So we have a lot of movement. And just one moment, we will speak about another massive uh, move on the world stage in regards to a Palestinian state right here where we're sitting. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean... You know what we're not even getting into today? Everything that's happening in Judea and Samaria, because like at the same time, we got Iran talking about Israel and the West Bank, and, and we got uh, Israel's prime minister defending Israel on the, uh, the UN stage at the same time saying he supports the Palestinian state. There's like a lot of unrest happening in Judea and Samaria as we speak. The IDF has been rooting out terrorism for months, and they're still not done. You know, they're still working on it because they're getting scared. Well, at the same time, we got another, you've heard of BDS. We got another discrimination against Judea and Samaria. Israel's government is expected to approve a deal 
within the next couple of weeks that's called Creative Europe. It's a deal with the European Union, basically for cooperation, probably for trade, uh, for cultural cooperation. The cultural culture and sports ministry here in Israel estimates that this trade plan will bring in a lot of money into Israel's economy. But there's just one little problem with this trade this plan uh, for mutual cooperation with the European Union is that there's one little caveat and the EU said basically any areas of Israel that were liberated in the 1967 six-day war are not allowed to be included in this plan. We're not just talking about the West Bank. We're not just talking about uh, one area. We're talking about East Jerusalem. We're talking about Judea and Samaria, the Jordan Valley, the Golan Heights. A lot of people don't realize you've literally just cut out like most of Israel. Yeah. I think actually we should do a series on location sometime where we just drive the actual map of Judea and Samaria. And then we, you know, the Golan Heights, you include that, you include Jerusalem, you're just taking out Israel. So the European Union says we're interested in a uh, trade program, a, 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 a cultural cooperation program. It's going to bring, you know, tens of millions or even tens of billions of dollars into our each uh, individual countries and uh, in countries in Europe. But any areas that we decide we don't like, basically half of Israel or more, can't be included, right? Uh, there's already 53 signatures of members of Knesset who actively oppose Israel signing an agreement like this that actually discriminates against Israel's biblical heartland, including some from the ruling coalition government. Um, and to be clear, a lot of Israel's Knesset members oppose deals like this. A lot of them even oppose a two-state solution um, or a Palestinian state. Uh, many in the coalition, opposition, a lot of members of Knesset, they, they're thinking clearly. They're not like Yair Lapid. They oppose these types of things. And they're for all of Israel being the sovereign state of Israel, the Jewish nation in the Middle East, right? Uh, but speaking about discrimination against so many parts of Israel, BDS, which stands for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions, against the Jewish state has been going on for years, and it's well-funded, and it's an organized attempt to destroy Israel's economy, which basically means that uh, products that are made or come from any of these parts of Israel, they're discriminated against in many parts of the world. Many even non uh, many governments and countries discriminate against these products um, so that you can't purchase them just because they come from a small Jewish town in Judea and Samaria. Well, our good friends at Blessed by Israel are fighting that uh, discrimination and that BDS by actually bringing Israeli products from small Jewish businesses in Judea and Samaria to the United States, and they're shipping them directly to your door. Blessed, B-U-Y-Israel.com. We have a link in the description below. They're sponsoring uh, the Israel guys. They've come up with their own version of BDS, and it stands for Blessed, Bless, Defend, and Serve the People of Israel, especially those living in the biblical heartland. And right now, many of you guys have already joined this, the Heartland Challenge. That means you pick a product from Judea and Samaria, a small Jewish business, and you only use that product from Judea and Samaria. And Blessed by Israel makes it super easy because you go to their website, you use the code INVEST at checkout for $5 off your first order, and you purchase a product that supports a, a small Jewish business in the biblical heartland of Israel, the place that the world is discriminating against, you can now support those people and those businesses and those products. And it's so easy. You just go to blessedbuyisrael.com, click the link in the description below, get $5 off if you use invest at the uh, code for checking out, and you are fighting BDS. You're fighting world discrimination against this very place right here. So join the Heartland Challenge. Pick a product that you'll only use from the biblical heartland. Go to blessedbuyisrael.com. Dot com. Guys, we're getting back to Judea and Samaria and what in the world is going on on the world stage. We've got the UN going absolutely bonkers right now with the idea going back. Let's step back like 20 years back to uh, or 30 years even to Oslo Accords and peace talks and all of the craziness. You know what happened when that happened? Well, basically, uh, street riots broke out and literally... If this conversation continues, you will see more uh, bloodshed and riots and terrorism in Israel. Because guess what? When Israel is weak and talks about peace and negotiates with a arch enemy, that proxy army of Iran that's right here on Israeli soil, when they act weak, that proxy rises its head and fights furiously against the country. You're about to see it. If Israel continues down this road, you're about to see a lot of 
mess, unfortunately, here in Israel. There's another level. Well, one of the most, uh, well, we have two major players on the world stage right now that are causing trouble, and we've talked about one, Iran. Now, we have another one out there uh, that's Russia. Russia is actually getting involved right here where we're sitting. Or they're trying. They're trying. They're, Desperately. They're uh, making noise. They're Hopefully making they noise. they can't actually do anything boots on the ground. Well, but. the fact is, Luke, they've been in the region for a long time, sure. and they have been promoting uh, anti-Israel things within the neighborhood for a long time. So whether they've been actually in Israel is the question now. We know that they have, uh, since 2015 to 2018, we actually know that they employed 630,000 troops into Syria. Now, that's a lot of troops. And wow. why in the world? There was a civil war wait, going we're on. We're talking were, Russian troops, like 63,000 Russian troops in Syria? From 2015 to 2018. There's no stats on how many are there now, but I assume they did. And they obviously pulled out some because of the war in Ukraine. But, I, but I, there are Russian troops in Syria. We right know that now. for like, sure. We know there definitely are troops. But. And they do cooperation together with uh, you know uh, fighting and drills and all these things. But Why? What in the world are they doing right in Syria? Well, they were involved with the civil war that was going on there, and they helped to, to prop up the regime that's over there now. But Russia is no big friend of Israel, even though there's some cooperation. But the big news now is, is that Russia, Putin, has offered direct military cooperation and assistance to who? The Palestinian Authority. Now, that offer is literally impossible. Well, like his offer is basically to like send... Military. Russian troops into Judea and Samaria to help the Palestinians, which True. can't even happen because Israel would not allow it. And obviously they can't just sneak in. I mean, maybe they could smuggle a few no, in, but, but we they are, can't Luke, just speaking, sneak their military in. We're speaking about Russia. But I mean, just the fact that Russia publicly announces that they want to help the Palestinians by sending their military into the West Bank is just, I mean, that if that's not a threat. No, it's a major what threat. What is? It's a major threat. And that's uh, what is literally happening now. We have Russia, knows the neighborhood very well, is right on Israel's border in Syria. They've had troops there for a long time and a lot of troops there at, at, at certain points. And now we also know that Russia is a major supporter of Iran's attacks against Israel. You know, there's this little war, kind of outside war going on against ships and you name it, drone wars going on between Israel and Iran anyway. Well, Russia is also supporting Iran's attacks in that way against Israel. Um, but yet there's some little cooperations between the two. Here's a major thing that's being uh, taking place now. Russia provides Europe with a lot of natural gas, and Europe is moving away from that, as all of you are already aware of. But who is replacing that natural gas. Well, it just happens to be that Israel struck a gold mine of natural gas in its Mediterranean Sea and is now putting in pipelines to Europe to supply Europe with natural gas. So now we have even more, a much more complex issue where Israel is now becoming a little bit more in the enemy's eye for Russia because they're taking a little bit of that leverage that Russia uh, had over Europe and still has a pretty good leverage now because Israel is not f fully filled up that uh, void that will be left there. Uh, but this is what's happening. Uh, Israel in 2020 made a pact with uh, Greece and Cyprus to put an underline, uh, underground pipeline into uh, Europe of natural gas, and Israel is working hard at that. Now, they're supposed to begin pumping natural now, in September, uh, just uh, this this month, they're supposed to begin that trade. Now, the pipeline's not finished. It's going through um, uh, through the Egyptians at this point. But still, we have natural gas from Israel going into Europe, and we have a decrease in natural gas being shipped into Europe from Russia. So now, Israel's taking a lot of uh, business, you could say, and a lot of that leverage off of Russia. And that is now, we may see some proxies coming against Israel for their uh, their their joining the Europeans in this way. Now, what will happen with that? Hey, it remains to be seen. But this is another level to the pressure being put on Israel to create an Islamic state. Take Palestine out of it. There's this ridiculous. There's no Palestinian state. That's that's ridiculous nonsense. An Islamic jihad army being stationed in Judea and Samaria to, with one goal, don't let anybody deceive you, to absolutely obliterate and destroy the nation of Israel. 
no, don't don't get any other feelings or, or thoughts about it. Gaza is a pure example for what the rest of this place would look like if there was to be a state of Palestine. It's going to be an Islamic regime. Hamas will take over and they will they will be fueled from Iran to do one thing, and that is to attack Israel. Don't be mistaken about that. If you haven't caught on yet, guys, a lot of people are talking about a very tiny piece of real estate here in the Middle East, and it happens to be the spot where we're sitting in this studio right now on the Mount of Blessing in Samaria, part of Israel's biblical heartland. World leaders converging in New York at the UN General Assembly talking about Judea and Samaria. Russia talking about Judea and Samaria. Uh, Iran, talking about Judea and Samaria. The European Union, trying to discriminate against Judea and Samaria. Unfortunately, Israel's own prime minister has made it really clear where he stands, and he claims that a large majority of Israelis stand right with him, and that is, for a two-state solution, proponent of the Palestinian state idea, which essentially means supporting, giving away large chunks of the land of Israel. Why are so many people of the world talking about this tiny piece of real estate and most of them in a negative light and then in the light of giving it away? It's because God chose to place his name here. God made a covenant with this land and he chose it for his people, Israel. That's why the world is so against this idea. But if you stand with the biblical heartland of Israel, let us know down in the comment section below. Say, I stand with Israel's biblical heartland. And if you want to take action, make sure you join the Heartland Challenge by uh, choosing at least one product to only purchase from a small family-owned Jewish business here in Judea and Samaria. And you can easily do that by going to blessedbuyisrael.com or click the link down in the description below and you can have products from Judea and Samaria shipped straight to your door. Guys, make sure you subscribe. We just hit 50,000 subscribers. We couldn't be more excited. Now we want to get to 100,000. So help us out by smashing that subscribe button and the notification bell and let us know what you think down in the comments section below. Episode four of the Temple Mount series getting so much traction. You guys are loving it. Episode four is dropping this Sunday. We will not have a program on Monday in honor of the Jewish holiday of Rosh Hashanah, the biblical Jewish New Year. That is on Monday and Tuesday next week. So we'll be back on Sunday and then we'll be back with our normal schedule next Wednesday. In the meantime, guys, tune out the fake news. Tune into what is actually happening here in the land of Israel. We're back here every single week with your direct connection to the land and people of Israel.